Praise the Lord. All right, so as we pray together in preparation for our Bible study tonight, you want to commit yourself to the Lord tonight, that the Word of God will reach out to your heart. You want to tell the Lord that you're coming here today, ordained of God, planned by God, purposed by God, will fulfill the divine reason. The divine purpose of coming to the Bible study. Open your mouth and pray to the Lord. That the Lord Himself, or the Spirit of Truth, will take the truth of the Scriptures and implant it in your heart. And that by this study of the Word, you become a righteous child of God, a holy child of God, a consistent, uncompromising child of God that God can depend upon today to be able to speak His word and to live out that word in the fullness as God intended when He wrote the word through this great holy men of God who are inspired by the Spirit that this word will lift up your heart to eternity to that final day when God will examine the hearts of men and the works of men that you'll not just be a religious church goer like multitudes of religious people in our land but that God himself will help you to be a wise virgin saved sanctified Sustained by His grace To live righteously, soberly, godly In this present age That the word of God will find a place in your heart That you'll give the honor, the glory, the first place to the God of heaven. Your life, your decisions, your family, in all your endeavors, everything you do. You'll be God conscious. You'll be conscious of eternity. So you don't lose any time. And you don't lose the privilege that the Lord has given you. In this period of probation, that you have all the knowledge necessary to live a victorious life in this our day. That God will grant you. That same grace He granted the worthies of old The patriarchs, the prophets, the preachers of old That the same grace Coming from the very throne of God Will flow into your heart Make you stand firm in this unchanging revealed truth of Scripture. 
And as the days run fast to the closing time, that you'll see that time, though far yet near. And God will help you to prepare for that reckoning day. And pray that out of this study, God will make out of you a courageous, loyal, uncompromising, firm, steadfast, soul winner, and preacher of the word. And the word you speak, the word you preach, will take fast hold in the hearts of the people, maybe one or two or ten or a thousand, how many there might be, that will listen to you, that this word will do a great transforming work of grace in their hearts and lives. Pray that your regular study of the word will help you to grow spiritually, growing towards the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And you'll not just be an ordinary believer, you'll become an extraordinary believer. Not just a hearer, but you become a teacher of the word yourself. Teaching with confidence and conviction. Turning others from sin unto righteousness. From darkness unto light. Turning them to submit their heart, their life, their will unto the God of heaven that they may escape the judgment that is coming upon the world of unrighteous people. This is a Bible school. This is where the Lord is growing us up, developing us, affirming His truth in our hearts and lives, preparing us for ministry. Pray that the Lord will make an Elijah out of you. A Peter, a Paul, a Stephen. An effective preacher of the word out of you as you come day after day and week after week from year to year. That the learner eventually will become a teacher, a preacher of the word himself. The Lord has done it for thousands of us. Why won't you be the next that your study, your knowledge will make you to be able to stand on your feet to declare, thus says the Lord.
That's God's intention. That's God's plan. That's God's purpose. Yield to Him. Make it happen. You'll be a doer of the word And then you'll be a preacher Of the word In Jesus name we pray Heavenly Father we do thank you For bringing us together once again tonight What a glorious scene As well as a solemn serious scene That you brought us together before you in your very presence to come and listen to your words authored, inspired by your spirit and preserved for us in your kindness and goodness so we can learn and in learning we come to be more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior and the work you've committed into our hands the great commission you've given us as a result of the study of this word and praying it in and practicing it out, we'll become people who are sound in the faith and people who will be able to tell other people this is the mind of the Lord. And as we reveal the mind of the Lord unto them by your spirit or by your grace or by your strength within us, they will bend the knee before you. They will surrender their lives to you. They become converts of the Lord Jesus Christ, followers, disciples of the Lord, and subjects of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, so that they and us will inherit the kingdom of God together in Jesus' name. Open the pages of the scriptures to us tonight once again. And we pray that the things we learn will be unforgettable. Make it work effectually, effectively in every heart, every life that listens today. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We can sit down. I welcome every one of you to the Bible study tonight. It's always a great joy to come and look at the Word of God together. And we're taking our time, by the way, as we go through the book of Daniel. There's so much in this book. From what is written there, from the narratives, the stories, and from the parts that each of the people played. There's so much to learn. We've looked at chapter 4 from verse 1 all through to verse 4, 37. And what we've done is we've taken what we call a panoramic view, a general view, a broad outlook from verse 1 all through to verse 27 and then from verse 28 all through to verse 37. We're now going to do something. There are some parts of the chapter that we need to look at. It's like now we want to do what we call a microscopic study. You take a telescope and then you look very far away and you'll see many, many things ahead. That's the use of the telescope. And then because of the importance of those different, different, different parts, you take the microscope. And then you look very intently and very closely at some of the things you missed out when you took a telescopic view. 
That's why tonight we're coming back. You might think we're going to chapter 5. It's too soon. It's too early to go to chapter 5. We need to put some pieces together here. And so tonight we're looking at Daniel chapter 4 from verse 19 to verse 27. Look at your Bible as we read. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished. That's the old English word for astonished, amazed, surprised. He was shocked for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. I'm sure you're familiar with that. In our local community, when somebody is talking to you, and somebody is saying, he had a dream, and the dream was very bad, you say, What's that dream? Tell me. Oh, he says, I don't want to tell the details. They say that this will happen to my, tell me out loud, to my enemy. Actually, it means that this is what I saw. And this is what they said is coming to me. But then he doesn't want to accept it. He doesn't want to say it will happen to him. He said, this is what they said will happen to my enemy. That's exactly the language Daniel is using here. He said, this dream is terrible. The interpretation is shocking. And the only thing I can wish for the king of Kadnezah is that the interpretation thereof be to thine enemies. In verse 20, the tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, was high reached unto the heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all. Under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king. It is thou, O king. Think about that. The courage, the uncommon faithfulness of a prophet to be able to face King Nebuchadnezzar and to be able to say, did you hear that the watcher, the angel, the holy one from heaven said, cut down the tree. King, I'm here to tell you, the God of heaven has taken a decision, has made a decree over you. It is thou, O king, thou hast grown and become strong. And for thy greatness, thy greatness is grown and reaches unto heaven. And thy dominion to the edge of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher and an holy one coming down from heaven. And saying, hew down, cut the tree down, and destroy it. Yet leave the stump, the stem of the roots thereof in the earth. Even with a band of iron and brass and the tender grass of the field. And let it be wedged with the dew of heaven. And let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. This is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king, that they shall drive thee from men. Think about this to start with. Which prophet in this land? Which preacher in this land? Which pastor or priest in this land of ours? Or in this continent of Africa or beyond? Will be able to face a Nebuchadnezzar, a prince, a president, a governor, a rich man, a lofty and a high man today, and be able to say, This is the interpretation of great man. 
They shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wedge thee with the dew of heaven. And seven times seven years shall pass over thee, till thou know. What was he telling him? You seem ignorant of the Most High. You seem ignorant of the great majesty and the glory and the power of the Most High. This is coming on you. And it's going to stay until you know that the Most High rulers in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And whereas they commanded to leave the storm, the stem of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be shown to thee. After that thou shalt have known. Nebuchadnezzar, this is not just a matter of time. Seven years will pass. But the seven years is just one part of the story. Until you would have known that the heavens do rule. That was the interpretation. But Daniel did not stand up and then run away. Thinking, I wonder how I could have said that to Nebuchadnezzar. I wonder how I could have had the courage, the conviction, the commitment to even stand before Nebuchadnezzar. And to tell him what I told him. He didn't run away. He said, that is the dream that is the interpretation but now before I leave I'm going to counsel you I know you are not expecting counseling all you wanted was interpretation but I have not finished my duty my responsibility until I give you counsel verse 27 wherefore O king let my counsel be acceptable unto thee and break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor if it may be a lightning of thy tranquility, of thy peace of thy quietness the prophet's call is a rewarding call but there are times when the prophet is called upon to deliver a serious, solemn weighty message the preacher's commission is a very high commission, a holy commission, a heavenly commission with great rewards. But it's not always an easy task to go to all the people that the Lord will send him and to speak whatsoever the Lord will command him. There are times when the prophet or the preacher or the pastor is sent to bear and to deliver heavy tidings to the high and lofty among men. That's where we have a farming of real preachers that was that's, that are worth their salt in this country, in this continent. This continent is filled with churches, with pastors, with preachers, with evangelists, with proclaimers of the Bible. But everything looks psychological, motivational. We never have any word for the wicked. And the people who are fighting corruption in the world, they're doing a better job than the pastors and the preachers and the evangelists in this land, in this continent. Those uh, people who are fighting corruption, they stand up firm. And they do not mind, they do not worry who they have to point to or arrest or check up on. And while the preachers have their shaking knees and trembling hearts and trembling voices, and they cannot stand up like Daniel to challenge the corruption in the land, the people who do not claim to be Christians, who do not claim to be preachers of the gospel, they're doing a great job, they're doing a better job. If Daniel were alive today, Daniel would do a greater job than anybody fighting corruption in any land, any part of the world. Because that man did the will of God and did not mind what the consequence might be. My prayer, your prayer, our prayer together is that God will raise up Daniel's. 
And you might be the Daniel. That's why God brought you here tonight. For you to see somebody like you. A man of flesh and blood like you. And all he did, he did by grace. He did by the power of the Spirit of God. And the Lord is saying, Daniel has come and gone. You are the one there today. The brother, the sister. And you know, sometimes as you look at this, our nation. And then you see that a man was the chairman of, you know, the, the commission. The, uh, that's the ministry that is fighting the corruption. And you said, this man is bold. And this man is courageous. And then they replaced that man with a woman. And then you say, I saw the man was bold. This woman is another thing. Bold. Authoritative. And then wanting to crush corruption anywhere she finds the corruption. And what a lesson for us who say we are saved, we are sanctified, we have the double work of grace, of salvation, and of sanctification, and we have the power of the Holy Ghost within us. And now when it comes to fight sin, Corruption and evil, even in our local, local house fellowship, in our local zone, in our local district, what kind of job are we doing when it comes to preaching the gospel and presenting the unadulterated word of God to the people in our community? What are we doing? Daniel says, we can do better, we're going to do better. And we're not going to look at any face and look at anyone and tremble and shake before anyone. If Daniel, your senior brother, could stand before Nebuchadnezzar today, I believe you will stand. And so, well, we need preachers today. Those who will declare the word of God and they'll be able to say, I am sent to thee with heavy tidings. There may be times when entire audiences might say, this is an hard saying. Who can bear it? When the preacher knows that his hearers would say, this is a hard saying, who can receive it? He might be tempted to think, this is a hard message, who can receive it? Our calling, our commission, will not always attract the praise of men. Natu natural men, carnal men, are so committed to doing evil that they will hate and reject the preacher or the evangelist rather than hate their sin and repent of their evil. That the man who is sent from God with a message originating from heaven must not fear any man on earth. The fear of man brings a snare. Such fear leads the preacher to unfaithfulness and brings God's judgment upon him. It is easier, it is even better to suffer temporary wrath of man than to incur the eternal wrath of God. Rather displease man than displease God. Why? Because if men decide to persecute you, God can deliver you from the wrath of all men. But on the other hand, if God decrees to punish you, for your faithfulness, for your instability, for your fear of man. No man can deliver you from his hand. Look at this Daniel. Daniel's commission was not always easy. But he had enough grace. You'll get the grace today. And he had enough courage. That courage is coming to you now. He had enough grace and courage to discharge his duty faithfully. Called to be a servant of God, he was Never a slave of man. Nebuchadnezzar gave him a scholarship. He was never a slave of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar fed him free for three years. He was never a slave of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar tested him and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego with all the others. And Nebuchadnezzar gave him distinction that was ten times better than the rest of them. Nebuchadnezzar gave him a certificate, but he was never a slave of Nebuchadnezzar. 
Nebuchadnezzar gave him a job, a position in the palace of Babylon, but he never became a slave of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar promoted him after he had given him a job. The promotion did not make him to become subservient, a slave. He was never a slave of Nebuchadnezzar. Men may do something for us. That's our right. You are a citizen of your country. And if you've gone to school and you've read, you pass. That doesn't make you a slave of that teacher that gave you the pass mark. You go to a school and you have a certificate. Good. That's because you studied and God helped you. That doesn't make you a slave of that educational institution. And then you go for an interview and you have a job. Very good. It's because you went through the interview, you passed. That's why you got the job. That doesn't make you a slave of the employer. You see, there are people, they easily become slaves. He helped me. He gave me a certificate. He gave me a job. He gave me some money. He gave me promotion. He gave me whatever. And then they become slaves. But Daniel remained a child of God, a servant of God. And Daniel became a, a person that stood firm for the truth. Never a slave of man. You'll not be a slave. Slave trade is over. But you see, there are people that still have the heart, the mind, the attitude of slavery. But in the case of Daniel, don't you remember? They were captured from their land and they were brought to Babylon. He said, you can capture me and even chain my hand and you can bring me and take me in the chariot and take me from Jerusalem and Judah and bring me to Babylon. You are never going to take my heart, my soul, my mind, my conviction captive. I am free. And that is what every child of God ought to know. That although you might be walking in a place and then you resume at the time they tell you to resume and you close at the time they tell you to close, but you have a moral standard and you have a moral conviction and that moral conviction will not be under slavery to anybody on earth in Jesus' name. And so then we find something that controls Daniel. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 32, he had days always before him. What things soever I command you, thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. God's message to Nebuchadnezzar was so fearful and frightening that Daniel was astonished for one hour. No such judgment had ever been pronounced on any man on earth. It was a strange punishment. Look at Job chapter 31 Strange punishment Job chapter 31 We're looking at verse 3 It's not destruction to the wicked And it's strange punishment To the workers of iniquity That's what was coming on Nebuchadnezzar It was a strange punishment And even Daniel's thoughts When he thought about the punishment It shook him It troubled him in his heart What was he to do now? Would he have the courage to speak the whole truth? Would he hide the unpleasant message from the king? Well, Amos chapter 3 verse 8 says, The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy. That's where we find Daniel. You are that Daniel today. We're dividing the study to three parts. Number one, the prophet's freedom from the fear of man. I pray God will set you free. Number two, the preacher's faithfulness to the full message not subtracting anything not taking anything away from that message number three they preach the pastor's fidelity and focus in ministry we're coming to daniel chapter four let's look at him from verse 19 the prophet's freedom from the fear of man in verse 19 then daniel whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished 
for one hour and his thoughts troubled him the king spake and said Belteshazzar let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee Belteshazzar answered and said my lord the dream be to them that hate thee and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies the tree that thou sawest which grew and was strong whose height reached unto the heaven and the sight thereof to all the earth whose leaves were fair and the fruits thereof much and in it was meat for all under which the beasts of the field dwelt and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation it is thou O king fearlessness courage uncompromising stand not altering the message not watering down the message not diluting the message not making the message acceptable not cutting off rubbing off the rough edges of the message giving it as it is it is thou O king thou art grown and become strong for thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven and thy dominion to the end of the earth well thank God for a man like this I want to see many people like this man today could, there, could any other man be that bold and courageous before Nebuchadnezzar don't you know the history of Nebuchadnezzar Nebuchadnezzar was known for his habitual anger his habitual rage his habitual fury his habitual wickedness his habitual cruelty everybody knew Nebuchadnezzar when chapter 4 in chapter 1 what do we learn about it the prince of the eunuch said I fear the king then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king on ordinary thing, if the king discovers that you are not eating the food he has given you, the only punishment you will have for me is to cut my head off. That's what they knew about him. In chapter 2, when we met this Nebuchadnezzar, the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Why? He had a dream he had forgotten. And he said, I've forgotten the dream. Tell me the dream. King, who is guilty? You, who had a dream and you forgot. Or me, I didn't have the dream with you and I don't know it. Who is guilty? I don't want to know who is guilty. Tell me the dream. If you don't tell me, you are gone. That's how the new Nebuchadnezzar. In chapter 3, what did we hear about Nebuchadnezzar? Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury. And the form of the visage was changed and commanded that they should heat the furnace seven, seven times more than it was once to be heated and he commanded to cast them into the burning fairy furnace he had no mercy there was no milk of human affection in his veins, in his heart, in his life and yet before such an angry man, a furious man, a wicked man, a cruel man Daniel stood and said Thou art the man. It is thou, O king. That's the kind of courage that the Lord expects in a preacher of the word, in a soul winner, in anyone that is a Christian. Anywhere you find yourself, you're not looking at their rage, at their fury, at their action, at their behavior. Are their threatenings? You're not looking at the possibility of they oppressing you. You fear God more than you fear man. Can we find any prophet, any preacher, any pastor that will declare the bitter truth to such a man as Nebuchadnezzar today? Is there any minister that will bear the heavy tidings to such a proud, wicked, notorious monarch? Where is the evangelist today? National evangelist, state evangelist, or international evangelist? Where is the evangelist today? Where is the watchman today that will sound the alarm of heaven's saint warning? 
Before such a man who does not fear God nor regard man, can God trust the preachers of this our country? Almost on every street, you see a signboard. In every paper, every day you open the pages, you see the advertisement of a religious gathering, convocation, convention, camp meeting, whatever. And then you're seeing so and so is going to minister. What are they telling them? What are we telling the people? Can we find such a man today that will lead this nation to repentance? Can we find such a man today that will blow the trumpet of alarm and say, this nation and this continent of Africa were becoming more and more rotten? And that the more the churches multiply, the more the assemblies multiply, the more corruption is increasing. Can we find a man today that will not care for money, that will not care for gifts, that will not care for a good name, that will not care for awards? And then we'll be able to speak the word of God like Daniel. And then, while Daniel was free, from the fear of man, it was full of love towards Nebuchadnezzar. It was neither rash nor impolite. He had regard and respect and pity and compassion for the king. A desire not to hide the truth from the king, but to reveal the truth that will lead him to repentance and salvation. While we avoid rashness and indiscretion, we must not entertain the fear of man in our hearts. What if we do? What does fear of man do to the preacher? What does the fear of man do to a Christian? What does fear of man do to a woman? A Christian woman that knows the truths that we may come in here over and over and over. The message of salvation you know And the message of repentance you know And the message of come out from among them And be not unequally yoked together with some believers That you know Why are you not practicing it? Fear What will they think of me? What will they say of me? As they look at me What will they be thinking about me? Not Daniel what does fear do to a man? A man that is walking in a place, you know that stealing is bad. And then, you know, when they are changing the receipts, and when they are touching this or that, and when they are carrying or cutting away millions of our currency, you know it's bad. Why do you turn the other face? Why do you act as if you don't see? Why do you sign something you shouldn't sign? Why? Fear of man. Fear of man has an evil, malignant evil against or influence on people. Number one, it enslaves man, makes you a slave. Number two, it overrules the conscience. Number three, it destroys the strength and the constancy of the mind. Number four, it makes man to disgrace himself and leads him to disgrace and degradation. Number five, it destroys the dignity of man. And then number six, it destroys the ministry of the minister. Fear of man will destroy the ministry of a preacher, the ministry of a pastor, the ministry of an evangelist, the ministry of a teacher. If you know you are called of God to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints... Why are you not doing it? Why are you avoiding the difficult topics of the Bible? Why is there no judgment, no sound of alarm from the watchman? Why are you destroying your ministry? Because of the fear of man. Number seven, it leads to compromise on faithfulness and sin. Fear of man is a deadly foe to a godly life and to an effective ministry. The twin virtues of faith in God and faithfulness to God will keep and protect your heart, my heart, our hearts from the fear of man. Tonight we're free. And it wasn't Daniel alone. You know, there were other people in Bible days that had this freedom. 
from the fear of man. Let me show you just a few of them in First Samuel chapter 15. First Samuel chapter 15. And we're reading from verse 16. Here Saul had done something wrong. And Samuel had to challenge him. In First Samuel chapter 15 verse 16. Then Samuel said unto Saul. Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord has said unto me this night. And he said, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou was little in thine own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel, and the Lord sent thee on a journey, and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil and its evil in the sight of the Lord? He was not talking to a poor farmer. He was not talking to an illiterate. He was not talking to somebody in a village somewhere. He was talking to the king of the land. That's boldness. That's fearlessness. And Samuel said, why? Have you done this? You've committed sin. You've done wrong. In the sight of the Lord. In verse 20, and Samuel and Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. And I've gone the way which the Lord sent me. And I've brought Agag, the king of them of Amalek. And I've utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen. The chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed. To sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel was not about to accept any excuse. He was not about to be pushed back. Because of any kind of twisted reason or reasoning by the king in verse 22, and Samuel said, As the Lord has great delight in bunch offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness as the iniquity and idolatry, because thou, Saul, hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. Think about that. That's straightforward. There wasn't anything a uh, kind of shaking, trembling in that. That was firm, courageous, direct. That's what you call confrontational preaching. That he confronted him with a sin. We're looking at Second Samuel chapter twelve, verse seven. Second Samuel chapter twelve, verse seven. And Nathan said unto David. Thou art the man. You see the prophets of old. That's why they were called prophets. In our land, this country, and then in the whole continent of Africa. And even beyond, you find many people that will say they are prophets so and so. I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure. Prophets so and so. When last did they stand firmly in the ministry of the prophets? The prophet is not just seeing vision of prosperity for sinners, vision of healing. And you know, as our country is, you know, the trend and the direction our country is going, December will soon come. And you'll find a lot of those prophets coming out. And then they'll be telling the nation a lot of prophecies. That's what they always say, you know. And they're going to tell us this December as we go to January. The Lord said, I'm happy with this nation. The Lord said prosperity is coming. The Lord said the years of farming, it's over. The Lord is telling us in this country, in this continent, things are going to become better. Where are the prophets of the Lord that are able to tell the people? By the way, I told you before, all those uh, corruption fighters, they're not buying into that. All those corruption fighters, they are not buying into those false prophecies. Whether it's December or January, they are, they are running after those corrupt people. 
and they are kind of arresting them and questioning them and they are freezing their accounts don't buy into all these false prophecies why? how can it be that the people that do not pretend to be prophets or preachers they are more faithful than those who say they are raised up of God the prophets of old they declared the might of God and we are here today you are there today you will declare the mind of God in verse 7 Nathan said to David thou art the man thus says the Lord God I anointed thee king over Israel and I have delivered thee out of the hand of Saul and I gave thee thy master's house and then he went on and on look at verse 9 wherefore as thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and has taken his wife to be thy wife and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house because thou hast despised me and has taken the wife of Rad the Hittite to be thy wife thus says the Lord behold I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house that's a prophet a prophet will not gloss over sin will not because of fear because of what they will do and because of the privileges advantages they will take away from him it will not because of that run away from telling the truth and that's what we find in first kings chapter 14 first kings chapter 14 I'm looking at verse 6. First Kings chapter 14 verse 6. And it was so, when Ahijah heard the sound of her feet, as she came in at the door, that he said, Come in, thou wife of Jeroboam, why feignest thou thyself to be another? They knew this prophet, that he knew their wickedness, he knew their evil. And they knew that if the wife of the wicked king Jeroboam appeared as she was normally, uh, the prophet will say, You have come, and they will deliver a hard message. And so the husband, the king, told her, the wife, to disguise herself, to pretend to be another woman. But you couldn't deceive those prophets of old. And so while she was coming in, the prophet said, Come in, wife of Jeroboam. Why are you pretending and feigning and disguising yourself to be the wife of another? Come in, I have a message for you, I'm waiting for you. For I, for I am sent to thee with heavy tidings. Heavy tidings. Those are prophets. The people like Daniel that will stand. And they will declare the words of the Lord. Today, we'll do it in Jesus' name. In Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. I will read verse 12 first. Mark chapter 12, verse 12. And they sought to lay, on, to lay hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them. And they left him and went their way. That's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. They wanted to arrest him. They wanted to kill him. And, and he knew, he knew that they were plotting that against him. They that then shut his mouth because of his life. They that then closed him up. Because he knew they were planning something evil against him. Look at verse 38. And he said unto them, In his doctrine, beware the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutation in the marketplaces and the chief seats in the synagogues and the uppermost rooms at feasts, which devour widow, widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater condemnation. Even though he knew that they were plotting against him. 
And they were fighting against him. And they wanted to destroy him. Yet, he still spoke the truth. He warned the people of their deception, of their false doctrine. And he didn't say that privately and secretly. He said that openly for everybody and those concerned to hear. Let's go to point number two. The preacher's faithfulness to the full message. We're coming to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel. We're looking at chapter 4 of Daniel. Verses 23 to 26. Daniel 4, 23. And whereas the king saw a watcher and an holy one coming down from heaven and saying, Heal the tree down, cut the tree down, and destroy it. Yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a bunch of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field. And let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field, till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. This is the decree of the Most High, which is come upon my Lord the King. Here comes the interpretation. Here comes the message in fullness. They shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee eat grass as an oxen, and they shall watch thee with the dew of heaven. And seven times seven years shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth thee to whomsoever he will. And whereas they commanded to leave the storm of the tree roots, Thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee after, not until after then, after, after that thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. Can you see this man here, Daniel? Yes, he was tender hearted, but he was truthful. He was courageous. He had the strength of character to declare the truth without flinching. To maintain a clear conscience before God and man. He had to allow the spirit of truth to have full control of his heart. What Daniel declared was a divine mystery. But he did not allow his intellect to interfere with the mystery of God. This is a mystery. And the Bible is full of mysteries. And the faithful man, the spirit-filled minister, will not fail to declare the mysteries of God just because you cannot understand. That's a mystery. That does not make you to allow your intellect to interfere with the mystery of God. When God said, Noah, I'm bringing a flood upon the land. Everybody will be destroyed in the flood. That was a mystery. It had never rained to flood the land like that before. And when God said, I'm bringing fire and brimstone upon Sodom and Gomorrah. That was a mystery. It had never happened before that time. But Lot went out and he said, Up, oh, get out of this place. A mystery is going to come. This nation, this country, or this uh, city will be destroyed. That was a mystery. And when God said, Go tell the children of Israel, Moses, tonight, I'm going to visit the land of Egypt. All the firstborn in the land, I'm going to slay them because Pharaoh refuses to let my son go. It was a mystery, something that never happened before. And when God said, Israel, go around Jericho. And all those people in Jericho, they'll be destroyed only by the shout of the praise of the people of God. It was a mystery. Nobody ever heard of anything like that before. But you know, all those preachers and prophets and patriarchs, they did not allow their intellect and their mind or their misunderstanding or lack of understanding to interfere with the mystery of God. And here was a mystery. It had never happened to any man. 
in the history of the world that a man will become mad like an animal and then will be eating grass and then they will chain him down he will be driven off from the throne he will be in the open field and the dew of heaven will come over him for seven years and he'll just be rattling and rambling along with the animals it had never happened to man to a king it was a mystery but daniel said this is mysterious because the god of majesty has a lot of mysteries and he declared that mystery without mincing words that's what, the, that's what the Lord is telling us today. There are a lot of mysteries in the Bible. The Lord is telling us that the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise. That's a mystery. And you're not going to allow your mind, your brain, your intellect to interfere with that mystery. Declared, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but in a twinkling of an eye, the trumpet shall sound. And then it says, the dead shall rise, and we which are alive will be caught together with them in the air. It's a mystery. But you're not going to allow your intellect to interfere with that. You declare it and you pronounce it as the Lord has said. That's exactly what this man Daniel did. Ministry would be easier if we could remove the idea of penalty, of judgment, of hellfire from our preaching. If we can just preach about love and forgiveness and mercy and goodness and prosperity and provision and deliverance and good, good things, ministry would be easy. Almost anybody can be a preacher. But to pronounce doom and damnation on sinning humanity is an unpleasant task. Human tenderness does not want to preach, to preach it, yet we must. There are passages of scripture that a preacher might prefer not to read, not to expound, and not to explain, yet he is under divine orders to faithfully declare all the counsel of God. We must faithfully do what the Lord has called us to do. We cannot conceal the horrors that await your repentant sinner. Daniel had no flattering words for Nebuchadnezzar because God had no such words for him. God was speaking to the man. Such, and Daniel was on the channel. And he would not obstruct, he would not distort God's message to the wicked monarch, to the wicked king. And then here is it, Daniel did not take away whatever might seem offensive from God's message to the king. Wasn't it offensive to even the hearing of a normal person? They'll drive you out. You'll become mad. You'll eat grass like animal. And you will not even come for shelter in the night. You'll not be like a domestic animal. You'll be like a wild animal in the rain, in the sunshine, in the dew. Everything will be falling upon you. That was not a palatable thing. That was not something you welcome. But Daniel did not take away what might seem offensive from that message. Why should we ever take out any seemingly offensive detail from the divine word. Lies and flatteries do not lead anybody to repentance. That's why many people are running to meetings and whatever it is, they are running to you and there's no conviction, there's no conversion because lies and flatteries do not lead to repentance. Half truths cannot save the soul. If our goal in ministry is the salvation of souls and not vain glory, we shall declare the whole truth of God's word fearlessly, forcefully, and faithfully. But it wasn't only Daniel. Other people too that got called in Bible days, they did exactly what God called them to do. This is your own time. You'll do what the Lord has called you to do. I said you will do it. Like Daniel, now we can have not just one Daniel in a nation of in a nation Babylon. Now we can have many Daniels, and then we can stand and declare the word of the Lord, and the power of God will go with you. The protection of the Lord will be with you, and nobody will touch your life in Jesus' name. 
let's look at them. We're looking at First Kings chapter First Kings chapter twenty-two. First Kings chapter twenty-two. Daniel was not alone. There were people like him in Bible days, and there should be people like him in a contemporary time, even today. In First Kings chapter twenty-two, verse nineteen. And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by him, on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab, that he may go up and fall at Ramos Gilead? And one said on this manner, and another said on that manner, and there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? How are you going to do that? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now therefore behold the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets and the Lord has spoken evil concerning thee. But Zedekiah, the son of Shenina, went near and smote Micaiah on the cheek and said, Which way went the spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? You see that when this man prophesied as Micaiah, another one false prophet that wanted smooth, smooth saying, went and then smote him on the cheek and said, How did you see a vision like that? Where did the Spirit of God go? Let me and come to speak to you. And Micaiah said in verse 25, Behold, thou shalt see him. In that day, when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. Verse 26, And the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and carry him back unto Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus says the king, Put this fellow, that's the prophet, Put this fellow in the prison, and feed him with the bread of affliction and water of affliction until I come in in what? In peace. And then did Micaiah then become a slave, bowing his head, trembling, cringing, crushed, because now, because of his message, he was going to suffer. Look at verse 28. And Micaiah said, If thou return at all in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. He said, If you go to that war, I've declared to you, judgment has come. And even though you put me in prison, if you come back in peace, then the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, Harkin, O oh people, every one of you, yes, they have, were listening, I will know who is right by the end of the chapter. Before the end of the chapter, Ahab died for his iniquity he didn't repent of. The prophets of God, they always declared the word of God. And they did it forcefully, faithfully, and Fearlessly. We're looking at Amos chapter 3. Amos chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 1. Here we have another prophet of God. They tried to shut him up. But he will not shut up. You will not shut up. Amos chapter 3 verse 1. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, Ye only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. That's a prophet. The Lord will not gloss over your iniquity, will not excuse your iniquity, will not overlook your iniquity. Therefore, will I punish you for all your iniquities. Can two walk together except they be agreed with a lion roar? Will a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? 
Will a young lion cry out of his den if he has taken nothing? Can a bird fall in a snare upon the earth when no gene is for him? Shall one take his snare from the earth and has taken nothing at all? Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in the city and the Lord has not done it? Surely the Lord God will do nothing but He reveals His secret unto the servants, His prophets, the prophets. The lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Until you to look at verse 11. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the Lord God, an adversary there shall be, even round about the land. And he shall bring down the strength, thy strength from thee, and thy palaces shall be spoiled. Did they congratulate him for being faithful, preaching the word, telling them the might of God? And did they all get on their knees and repent? No. What did they do? Chapter 7. Chapter 7 verse 10. Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam king of Israel saying, Amos has conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. Why? Because they were not willing to repent. They wanted a preacher, a pastor, a prophet that will come and just rob them and pat them at the back. That will say, you're doing okay, you're doing all right, yes, no problem, who is not a sinner? Everybody is sinning and God is a merciful God and God is going to overlook everything you've done. It's such a God of love and indulgent God. It's such a good, good father. He knows you are human beings. That's what they wanted. But Amos said, no. The soul that sinners, tell me out loud, it shall die. And so, they said, the land is not able to be all his words. In verse 11, for thus Amos says, Jeroboam shall die by the sword and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land also Amaziah said unto Amos O thou seer O thou prophet O thou preacher go flee away flee thee away into the land of Judah and there eat bread and prophesy there we don't want your message here we don't want your rebuke, your correction, your warning. Hold your peace. Go look for another field of ministry. Go to Judah and go and prophesy there. And then we're told in verse 13, but prophesy not again anymore at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel. Did you hear that? What's it? What is it? It is the king's chapel. As you go around the town, don't you see those chapels there? What do they tell them? What are they hearing? And he told Amos, and he said, Don't prophesy here. This is the king's chapel. And then it says, It is the king's court. Then answered Amos and said unto Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son. But I was an herd man, a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said unto me, Go, prophesy unto my people Israel. You are telling me not to do what the Lord has called me to do. The Lord said, Go, prophesy. And you tell me I should shut up and then go to another land. Well, he stopped. I said, will you stop? Will you stop? No. Verse 16, now therefore hear. 
He told me to stop. I have another message I'm going to give you. Here is it. In verse 16, now therefore hear thou the word of the Lord. Thou sayest, prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Therefore thus says the Lord. Then he continued the message again. And so we need to understand that nothing will shut us up. Nothing will shut you up in Jesus' name. Now point number three. The pastor's fidelity and focus in ministry. We're looking at verse 27 of Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. Verse 27. Wherefore, O king... Let my counsel be acceptable unto thee. Break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. If it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility, that period, that time of peace and quietness. It says, Break off thy sins. Break off thine iniquities. Do you understand? That is the focus of the ministry of a true prophet, of a commissioned preacher, of a Bible pastor, a pastor that actually stands on the word. That is the focus of ministry. Break off thy sins. And it's all over the Bible. Let me show you a few verses. Leviticus chapter 15 verse 31. Leviticus chapter 15. Break it off. Put it off. Put it away. Separate yourself from your sin. That is the message the Lord has given us, the Lord has given you. Leviticus chapter 15 verse 31. Thus says, Thus shall ye separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness. Separate them in your message. Tell them, break off your sin. Break off your iniquity that they die not in their uncleanness when they defile my tabernacle that is among them. And let's look at Genesis chapter 35. Genesis chapter 35 Whether it's a prophet or a patriarch Or a preacher or a priest The same message Break off thy sin Break off thy iniquity Genesis 35 verse 2 Then Jacob said unto, the, unto his household And to all that were with him Put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments the same message Joshua chapter 24 I'm reading from verse 14 Joshua chapter 24 verse 14 Daniel was not alone in telling the king in saying break up thy iniquities break up thy sin that just means separate yourself from your sin. Put away, put up your iniquity and your sin. In Joshua chapter 24 verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away, put away, break off, put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood. And in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. In verse 23, now therefore put away, says he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. Break it off, put it off, put it away, separate yourself, turn away, repent. That's the message. In First Samuel chapter 7, verse 3 and verse 4. For Samuel chapter 7 verses 3 and 4 and Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel saying if you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts then put away the strange gods put it away break it up separate from it 
repent and turn around. And I shall off from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the children of Israel did put away Bealim and Ashtaroth and served the Lord only. Ezra chapter 10. This is the message of all the prophets, of all the preachers, of all the pastors. And if we are really called of God, we'll not be glossing over the evil, the iniquity, the sins of the people. We'll be telling them what all the prophets of the Bible, what he told the people. Put it away. Put it off. Cut it off. Break away all those iniquities and all those sins. Because if you don't, that iniquity will ruin you and drag you to the pit of hell forever and ever. And so you'll find those, the faithfulness of those prophets and those great men of God. And that's the same faithfulness that the Lord is calling us today. That you will say to the sinner, you'll say to the evildoer, you'll say to the people that are religious and not following the Lord, you'll say, cut it off break it up and put it away and put it up so that iniquity and sin will not be the ruin of your life. Ezra chapter 10, I'm reading to you from verse 2 and verse 3. Ezra chapter 10, we're looking at verse 2 and verse 3. You'll find it's still the same message that the man of God is giving that other people have given. And Shek and Shekaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, and answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God, and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Now therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away that's the solution. If there's going to be forgiveness, there must be repentance. If there's going to be a lengthening of thy tranquility, of thy peace, there must be a breaking away from sin. There must be a tearing away of iniquity. However precious or dear that thing might be to you, if God calls it a sin, put it away. It says to put away all the wives and such as are born of them, according to the counsel of my Lord. And and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law, according to the word. Look at verse 19. And they gave their hands that they will put away those strange wives being guilty and they offered the ram of the flock for their trespass. You see, in the time of Ezra, they told those Israelites who have married strange wives. That is, they left their first wives, so they still kept their first wives. And then they brought in other strange women, concubines that they call wives. Second, third, and fourth. And then when the message came to them, that if they were looking for the forgiveness of God and the mercy of God, they will break up their sin. They will put away the strange wife. And then they will keep to the only wife the Lord had given them according to his word. We're looking at Job chapter 22 verse 23. Job chapter 22. We're looking at verse 23. I'm just showing you that all over the Bible, from Genesis all over, is put it away, cut it off, break it off, put it off, so that sin, iniquity, evil... The abomination of idol worshippers and of those who do not know the Lord will not be your ruin. Job chapter 22 verse 23. It says, If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up, thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. That is the word of the Lord. And then it says then in verse, in verse 27, Thou shalt make thy prayer unto him, and he shall hear thee, and thou shalt pay thy vows. What those people said, the same thing you'll find in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1. In Isaiah chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 16. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16. Wash you, make you clean, 
put away. Do you see it all over the Bible? Break it off. Put it away. Put it off. Cut yourself loose from every abomination, every evil, every sin, every iniquity. It says, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, and plead for the widows. Come now, after you have put away the iniquity, come now. And let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as college, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient to put it away, it shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, can you tell me the rest? I thought God was making a Daniel out of you. Daniel did not speak like that. Now speak like you are another Daniel of the day. Won't you go? You see, that's a real prophet that is not afraid to tell everyone that if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. What Isaiah has done is not passing the baton, passing the responsibility and the duty to you and to me. And he's saying, go ahead and do that in your community as well. Isaiah chapter 58. We're looking at verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. And then he tells us in a verse, now in verse 9, in verse 9, Then shall thou call, and the Lord shall answer, and thou shalt cry, and shall say, and he shall say, Here I am, if thou take away. You see that? You see the message? You break it off. You take it off, you take it away, you put it off, you put it away, you separate yourself from every sin and every iniquity. If thou shalt take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and the speaking vanity. And then we're told in Jeremiah chapter 26, Jeremiah chapter 26, and I'm reading from verse 12. Jeremiah chapter 26 verse 12. Then spake Jeremiah unto all the princes. Of, and all the people saying. The Lord sent me to prophesy. Against this house. And against this city. All the words that ye have heard. Therefore now amend your ways and your doings. Amend your ways. Don't quarrel with the message of the messenger. Quarrel with your sin and separate from your sin. Don't run away from the preacher or the prophet. Run away from your sin. Amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord your God. And the Lord will repent of him, of the evil that he has pronounced against you. As for me, behold, I'm in your hands. Do with me as it seemeth good and meet unto you. That one does not matter. What matters is your relationship with God. Ezekiel chapter 11. In Ezekiel chapter 11, the same message, put it away, cut it off. Amend your ways. Repent. Turn away from evil. Turn away from sin. Repentance is the way into the forgiveness and the mercy and the salvation of the Lord. Ezekiel chapter 11 verse 18. And they shall come hither. And they shall take away, take away all the detestable things thereof. And all the abominations thereof from this. That's what he wants. That's what he commands. And that's what he desires that every sinner will do. That you take away all those detestable, abominable things. Ezekiel chapter 18. In Ezekiel chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 30. 
Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his way, says the Lord, the Lord God, repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away. You see that? The same thing. Break off. Take off. Take away. Put off. Put away. Cast away. But start here one. Cast away from you all your transgressions whereby you have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, says the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. Hosea chapter 14. In Hosea chapter 14, still the same message the Lord is giving through Hosea. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God. For thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with you words and turn to the Lord and say unto him, Take away how many iniquities? All iniquity and receive us graciously. So will we render the cows of our leaves. I sure shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses. Neither will we say any more to the works of our hands. Ye are our gods, for in thee the fatherless find mercy. Don't you find then, all over, that all those true prophets of God, all those preachers of the saving truth, what they did was to tell the people their sin, and they told them, break it up, get it up. Take it away. Cast it off. Because that is the only way for us to be able to have the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God, the salvation of the Lord. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3 verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, repent therefore and be converted, be turned around. Let there be a transformation, let there be a change. That the life of the past, the sinful life of the past, the abominable life of the past, the idolatrous life of the past, the licentious life of the past, and the fleshly, worldly life of the past will become something that is forgotten and forgiven. Get it off. That's the message. Whether you are looking at the Old Testament or the New Testament, it is the same message. Turn off from the sin. Look at verse 26. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you. In turning away every one of you. From what? From his iniquities. We're looking at Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. We're looking at verse 30. And verse 31. Acts 17 verse 30. It says, at, at the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth how many people? All men in how many places? Everywhere, every church, every land, every city, every place, everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. You'll find that the word of God is very, very clear. It's calling everyone to repentance. We're looking at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, I'm reading from verses 8 and 9. Remember, break it off. Remember, put it off. Remember, cast it away. Remember, put it away. And remember, separate yourself from every sin, every iniquity, and every abominable, detestable sin. In Colossians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 8. But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, 
malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye are put off the old man with his deeds. Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, I'm looking at verse 22 and verse 31. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, that she put off. You see, it's the same thing, Old Testament, New Testament, put it off. Break it off. Take it away. Cast it away. Separate yourself from it. Turn around. Repent. Amend your ways. That is the only path to the mercy of God. Verse 22, Ephesians chapter 4. And that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. We have done that ourselves and will tell all people we are speaking to, they must repent. I said they will repent. And as they repent, the Lord will have mercy on them and will forgive them and give them the same salvation He has given us. He will give, he'll give them in Jesus' name. Now we have been in Babylon. What I mean is in our study, because Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. And then uh, Daniel told him, he said, Judgment is coming. It's, up, it's upon you, King. And the Lord is bringing the judgment upon you. Therefore, break off your sin. Come out of your sin. What are we telling the people today? Revelation now, chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. We're looking at verse 4. Revelation chapter 18. In verse 4, it says, And I heard another voice from heaven, saying, Come out of her, of her, my people, that she be not partakers of her sins, and that she receive not of her plagues. He's talking about the Babylon of the present day, the evil system of the present day, because this evil system of this present day is going to be judged like old Babylon. Look at verse 21. And a mighty angel took up a stone, like a great millstone, and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall the great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. That's why in verse 4 it says, I heard that those of us who are living today and you're seeing Babylon coming back again in the pollutions, in the abominations, in the idolatry, in the nightclubs, in all the drinking and the dancing, in the prostitution, in the fornication, in the adulteries, in all the worldliness. See Babylon coming back and the Lord is saying the same thing that Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar. Come out of her, my people, that she be not partakers of her sins and that she receive if not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. If you are not out yet, you are coming out today. I say we're coming out today. And if you have come out already, you'll never go back to all those abominable, detestable things in Babylon anymore from tonight. You are free and free indeed in Jesus' name. And the Lord is putting that His Holy Ghost in your Holy Spirit, the power, the strength, the anointing, the unction, the conviction and the courage. He's putting that into you. And today you have the spirit of the conqueror. And then you are going out in your community. You are going out in your city. You are going out everywhere. And you are telling every Nebuchadnezzar, every Belshazzar, and you are telling every Herod, and you are telling every Pharaoh, and you are telling every prince, and you are telling every community man, and you are telling everyone you meet in your community, you are saying, come out, come out, come out, repent of your sin. You are calling them unto the Lord. You are a soul winner from tonight. You are a preacher from tonight. You are an evangelist from tonight. And like Daniel was bold and courageous, brother, sister, that courage is coming unto you now. And then you'll go back to where you came from and tell the sinners, come out of sin, come to Christ, they'll come to salvation. Why don't you stand up and say, Lord, that's me, I will do it. That's me, I will do it without flinching. That's me, I will do it without fear. That's me, I will do it without any cow. 
cowardice within me. That's me. I will do it like Daniel did it. I will do it. The Lord is calling you. And the Lord is calling you to boldness. The Lord is calling you to a, a ministry of authority and power. A ministry with anointing. A ministry with unction. A ministry with courage and forcefulness and faithfulness and fearlessness. And you will go to the people around you. You'll tell them, come out of sin. Come out of sin. Come out of sin. Because that is the only way you can have the salvation of the Lord. Promise the Lord, you will be another Daniel today. Dare to be a Daniel. That you challenge the sinners around you. And to courageously, convincingly, talk to everyone around you. That judgment is coming and you need to repent of their sins. You've been quiet long enough. You've been silent long enough. You have been fearful long enough. You have been timid long enough. Shake off that spirit of timidity. And shake off that cowardice out of your life. And then stand up like a real prophet of God. And stand up like a real preacher of the true gospel. And tell the sinners around you. Come out of your sin. Break off from your iniquity. And break off from your sin. So that iniquity will not be your destruction. The Lord is calling you to a courageous life. The Lord is calling you to a fearless life. A faithful life. A forceful life. That you have the unction. You have the power. You have the authority. The Holy Ghost upon your life. To be able to declare without fear, without favor, declaring the word of the Lord. Don't let the sinners crush your spirit. Don't let the sinners cancel the great ministry the Lord has given you. Don't be afraid of any Nebuchadnezzar. The Lord has sent you. And the Lord has given you the message. And the Lord is saying, declare it. Blow that trumpet of warning. Blow it, let everybody hear. Let the sinners hear. The soul that sinners, it shall die. And for them to escape that death, they need to turn away from sin and call upon the Lord. Don't fear any man and don't fear any woman. Don't fear any boy. Don't fear any girl. Declare the truth fearlessly, faithfully, forcefully. This is not the time to be timid. This is not the age to be fearful. This is not the time to be cowering and to be crawling. This is the time to stand erect and to stand firm and to proclaim and to declare the word of the Lord. This is a time for a Daniel to rise up in every community. For a Daniel to rise up in every city. This is a time for a Daniel to speak the truth of God forcefully and fearlessly and faithfully and to call the sinners to repentance that's the focus of our ministry it's the focus of the calling the commission that the Lord has given you, speak it out pray that the Lord will give you the same courage you meet a stranger talk to them a friend is in sin, talk to him talk to her don't allow any excuse from anybody. Don't flatter them. Flatteries will never convert any soul. Lies will never convert any soul. Tell them the truth. Pungent truth. Painful truth. Tell them. Bring them to the Lord. Let the spirit of the conqueror take hold of you. The spirit of the overcomer take hold of you. Like Noah, he declared the word. Enoch, he declared the word. Like Moses, he stood before Pharaoh. He declared the word. Declare the word. Maybe to one person or to two. Maybe to a family, maybe to a community.
maybe to a city, maybe to a church. Whatever your audience, men, women, or mixed, boys, girls, young people, students, what whoever they are, without repentance, nobody can have forgiveness. Except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. Break up your sin. Put off your sin. Put away your sin. Amend your way. Cast away your sin. Make sure you've done it yourself. While you are calling others to do it. Make sure you have repented. You have turned to the Lord. You are a child of God. Your sins are washed away in the blood of the Lamb. While you are calling other people to repent, make sure that you have repented yourself. No darkness, no sin, no iniquity, no righteousness, no abomination, no evil, no secret sin. Make sure that you have repented. And it is out of that platform of personal repentance and personal revival. You'll be able to tell other people to break away from their sin. Be a soul winner. Courageous soul winner. Fervent soul winner. Faithful soul winner. A fearless, forceful soul winner. An effective, productive soul winner. Daniel did not care for promotion or for prosperity. Not for men. Or money or might. He looked straight at the king and he said, O king, it is thou. The judgment is coming. And for you to avert that judgment, I'm able to escape that judgment. There must be the amending of your ways. Break it off. You don't care for popularity, do you? You don't care for gifts, do you? You're looking for their gifts. You don't be able to tell them the truth. You're looking for their well done, the praise of men. You don't be able to tell the truth. The praise of men or the fear of men will shut you up. But when you reject them, when you throw that off, You have nothing to do but to save souls. You have nothing to ask but to ask for their submission to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You demand nothing, you desire nothing. But they are surrendered to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. Nothing they have interests you. Nothing they possess attracts you. You hate covetousness. All you are asking for is for the people to turn away from their sin and to come to the salvation of the Lord. Be a Daniel from tonight. Be a Daniel from tonight. And desire nothing of their dentists. Desire nothing of what they promise. All you desire is the repentance. And their salvation. Promise the Lord. Promise the Lord. Make a commitment, a consecration, a vow. Unto the Lord. The days of timidity and intimidation. Those days are gone. Tell the Lord to help you. In the energy of the Spirit. In the power of the Holy Ghost. Tell the Lord to help you. That you'll stand firm. And declare. Thus says the Lord. Like Daniel. You'll be faithful to the full message. You'll not take anything away from the message. Neither will you add anything to the message. It's those who turn away from sin. And they turn unto righteousness. They turn from sin, they turn unto the Savior. 
They turn from their darkness. They turn unto the light. They turn from their idolatry. And they turn to the living God in heaven. And they turn away from all their self-righteousness. And they turn unto the Lord our Savior. Only those people are going to be saved. If your interest is getting so saved, you'll tell them the truth. If your interest is getting people to the kingdom of God, you'll tell them the truth. If your interest is seeing the kingdom of God populated by repentant people, righteous people, redeemed people, you will tell them the truth. It is the truth that brings people to repentance and salvation. Tell them, show them their ways. Tell them, show them their ways. The Lord is depending on you. And the Lord is calling you. And the Lord is saying, you be that Daniel from tonight. You be that Daniel from today. Preacher, pastor, overseer, evangelist. Proclaim the truth of repentance and righteousness without flinching. Without fear, without humility, possess the spirit of the conqueror and courageously declare the truth. Pray that God will make you another Daniel from tonight. The Lord will answer you and will give you the courage, the conviction, the confidence. An effective communication of the truth Like he did unto Daniel Ask, it shall be given you Seek, and you shall find Knock, and it shall be opened unto you This is one of the greatest gifts you can have The gift to courageously Declare the truth, the watch of God that will turn people away from sin and turn them unto righteousness. And they that turn many unto righteousness shall shine as the firmament of the heavens and they shall shine as the stars forever and ever. You have the commission tonight of the courage that goes along with it. Make a success of the ministry of the soul winner ministry of the evangelist ministry of the preacher ministry of the prophet the pastor